Violence and bloodshed fill the streets of Egypt as political unrest claims hundreds of lives, including the minority Christian population. Former GOP presidential candidate Senator Rick Santorum joins us to offer his perspective. And he's been president of the Catholic League for 20 years. Bill Donahue joins us from New York to discuss his battle with Facebook and much more. And in our Unseen Hero segment, the mystery priest who ministered to the victim of a serious car accident in Missouri, Father Patrick Dowling, speaks out. It's a story of faith and charity you will not want to miss. And we remember Judge William P. Clark, a faithful Catholic and a national security advisor to Ronald Reagan. He had a major hand in bringing down communism. We'll tell you about it in a special Encore interview. The World Over Live begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Rick Santorum, Bill Donahue, and that mystery priest from Missouri revealed, and much more. As always, we want you to be part of the program. You can tweet me at Raymond Arroyo or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. Violence is once again engulfing Egypt. More than 500 were killed in Cairo on Wednesday when Egypt's military moved to disperse backers of ousted Islamist President Mohamed Morsi. Both state authorities and the Morsi backers claim being attacked first. 43 policemen were among those killed in the violence, according to the government. In announcing a state of emergency on Wednesday, interim president Adli Mansour said the security and order of the nation are in danger due to deliberate sabotage attacks of public and private buildings and the loss of life by extremist groups. The statement added that authorities would take all necessary measures to maintain security and order. Wednesday marked the deadliest day in Egypt since the 2011 revolution that deposed then-President Hosni Mubarak. And in Egypt on Wednesday, dozens of churches and other Christian interests were among the properties ravaged by Morrissey supporters. A spokesman for the Catholic Church in Egypt said that seven churches were ransacked and or set ablaze, as well as 15 Coptic Orthodox churches. Amateur video captured this moment when this church was overrun in the city of Sohag. Christian schools and hospitals were also attacked. Islamists claim Christians helped orchestrate the demise of the Morsi presidency. More about this latest crisis in Egypt and President Barack Obama's reaction later in the show. And in Syria, according to two independent reports, the activist priest, Father Paolo Dal Oglio, missing for more than two weeks, has been executed by al-Qaeda-linked rebels. These are unconfirmed reports, one from a human rights watchdog group, the other from a Syrian rebel group. The Italian Jesuit is believed to have been kidnapped in late July following a protest rally against the military action of the Assad regime. Reuters reported at the time that an al-Qaeda group was angered by the priest's criticism of recent militant violence against Kurds on the Turkish border. And suspected violence by the jihadist group Boko Haram continues in Nigeria. On Sunday, in apparent coordinated attacks, militants crept into two mosques in northeastern Nigeria, gunning down 59 people who were in prayer. Under heavy security, Muslims there just days earlier celebrated the first public Eid festival in three years out of fear of a terrorist attack. This time, Boko Haram waited until after the Muslim observance. The extremists are blamed in the deaths of more than 1,600 people in the past two years, having also targeted Christians and government entities. And the persecution of Catholics in China continues. Vatican-affiliated Asia News is reporting that an underground priest in the Hebei province was arrested this past week. 
Father Song Wan Jun was arrested by 10 policemen and is the latest in a long line of clerics faithful to the Holy See to be arrested, imprisoned, tortured, or missing. Bishops arrested in 1997 and 2001 remain unaccounted for. The Catholic Patriotic Association, controlled by the communist regime, remains the only officially recognized Catholic entity in China. The whereabouts of Father Song are unknown and charges have not been announced. On a lighter note, and we need it, Pope Francis on Tuesday received the members of the Argentine and Italian national soccer teams. The two storied powerhouses were in Rome for an exhibition match, or friendly as it's called, in honor of the Argentine Pope. The Holy Father urged the famous athletes to be an example of loyalty, respect, and altruism, reminding them that for good or bad, they are role models for many young people. As for Wednesday's action on the pitch, Argentina dominated Italy for most of the match, winning two to one. And finally, a few personal notes. This August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption, marks EWTN's 32nd anniversary. A happy anniversary to all of you who made it happen and keep it here. And a special shout out to the woman who made it possible, and frankly, the reason I'm here and you're watching. On this same day in 1944, a certain girl by the name of Rita Rizzo entered a Cleveland convent and became Sister Mary Angelica. Had that young woman not made the difficult choice to commit herself to religious life 69 years ago, her community, her sisters scattered about the globe, this network might never have been. Mother Angelica reminds us of the importance of listening to those inspirations and making the hard choices for the right reasons, even when easier options are available to us. Tonight, we salute her for her willingness to give her all to God and her willingness to sacrifice for so many. Love you, Mother. I also want to thank all of you who've been praying for my wife's health. I urge you to continue to do so, and I'm very grateful. Now to the news of the day. Sectarian violence in Egypt is careening out of control, and the military is responding with strong countermeasures. My next guest is eminently qualified to discuss the implications of the Egyptian meltdown. He's a former U.S. Senator and member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, a 2012 GOP candidate for president, and most recently, a movie mogul. Here to enlighten us on Egypt and much more is Rick Santorum. Rick, You're thanks right. for coming it's on the show. Let's Thank start uh, this terrible situation in Egypt. More than 500 deaths now. You have the Interior Ministry allowing deadly force to protect institutions to protect the people, and yet the Muslim Brotherhood are calling for more protests, more stand-ins. What should the U.S. policy be at this time? Um, I get this question all the time, and for me it's not a fair question. The Obama administration has made every mistake you can possibly make. They, have, they, they, they went in and precipitated the fall of Mubarak. Not that Mubarak was a great guy, mm -hmm. but it was a stable democracy and a transition could have been orderly. The president sided with the rebels in the streets, overthrew Mubarak, then backed the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood, and, and backed them as they continued to move forward with, with Morsi. Yeah. They, they continue to move forward with which what seems to be something we see in South, South America all the time, which is one man, one vote, one time. Mm. And they were consolidating power, writing a constitution to, to, uh, to, uh, to institute Sharia law, right. block out and suppress the opposition, and the military and the people come and say, wait a minute, we didn't vote for this, we voted for real democracy, not Sharia, not one man, one vote, one time. Mm -hmm. And so the military, you know, strikes back. Now, am I for all the killing in the street? Of course, I wish, would not like to see all this killing in the street. But the idea that the Muslim Brotherhood is the victim here, they precip precipitated this. We should not be just saying, oh, you know, let this be peaceful, let this, let the Brotherhood, you know, have their place back. I, I disagree with that. The Muslim Brotherhood should not be allowed to come back and control any more than they should have been allowed to participate in the first place. They are a dangerous group. They are a radical Islamic fundamentalist group. And, and to su suggest that they can be adapted as a political 
political party. We saw in the few months that they were in office that they have no intention of allowing dissent if they could control again. Yet John McCain, your former colleague, and Lindsey Graham were just there. They were calling for Morsi's release. They were calling for the, the, the military to sort of stand down, to come to the table, and come to some agreement. That's a mistake. What's wrong with it? It's that? a mistake. It, it encourages the Muslim Brotherhood to, to continue the policies that, that they have, which is to, 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 to fight uh, and to organize and, and to oppose and to get strength and to gain strength. We do not need or want a strong mother Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or anywhere else in this world. So you're supporting a military coup is what I'm, people would say. I'm, what I'm supporting is a, the people of Egypt to regain the, a, a position where a legitimate democratic government can be elected. At some point, the object of our uh, of our policies, and this is something that, that I disagreed with George Bush on, the object of our policy should not be democratic elections as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. There's some countries that, that are not in a position to do democratic elections because the civil institutions are not mature enough to be able to do that. The political parties are not mature enough. We need to have stability and we need to increase political freedom, we need to increase uh, economic freedom, and eventually, at, over time, get to, get to free and fair elections. You also seem to be saying that these Islamist groups should should not even be a participant in a democratic election. Not the radical election. Islamic groups. There are, there are plenty of is, uh, Islamic organizations. But I'm talking that, about the jihadist yeah, mindset. Yeah, I mean, look, look at what the Muslim Brotherhood is. Look at who Hassan al-Banna is. Look at what they did. I mean, they conducted assassinations in, uh, in, in Egypt. They are, they are the principal. If you go back and look at al-Qaeda, and you look and see who they, who, uh, uh, all of the al-Qaeda leadership, many of which were from Egypt, yeah. who, they, who they look to, who they see as their theological uh, 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 forefathers, it's Hassan al-Banna, it's Sayyid Khattab. Those are, the star those are the folks, the Egyptians, who started the Muslim Brotherhood. They are radical jihadist and we should not be rallying to support them. I want to play this bite from you. This is the president from earlier today. Listen. To the Egyptian people, let me say the cycle of violence and escalation needs to stop. We call on the Egyptian authorities to respect the universal rights of the people. We call on those who are protesting to do so peacefully and condemn the attacks that we've seen by protesters including on churches. We believe that the state of emergency should be lifted, that a process of national reconciliation should begin, that all parties need to have a voice in Egypt's future. Can you have a process of reconciliation given the parties on the table right now and given the actions we've seen in recent days. This is the president who went to Cairo when he his first foreign trip and said, I don't have a problem with radical Islam. I don't have a problem with the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, these are all folks we can all deal with. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bottom line is we can't. They have no intention or desire to deal with the West. And uh, the idea that, uh, that uh, reestablishing a, a Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, leadership in Egypt is a good thing for Egypt, is a good thing for the Middle East, is a good thing for the United States, is absolutely folly. And uh, I, again, uh, this president doesn't have a clear understanding of who our enemies are and who our friends are, who want to destroy Western civilization and who want to advance it. And uh, I think the president's call for sort of, you know, both parties are to blame and everybody just needs to make up and get together is naive and is, uh, is, is not helping the situation in Egypt at all. Well, we have reports. Uh, one, Al Jazeera is reporting 17 Christian churches have been devastated. I've seen numbers as high as 30, maybe 40. And, and a lot of this was going on during the reign, if right. you will, of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Cops, I think, uh, I, I've seen varying numbers of yeah, the percentages. It's hard, to get, exact it's hard to get a number as to, but l thousands and thousands of cops who have left the country yep. uh, because of the Muslim Brotherhood. I'm not suggesting that right now that the military is a, a whole lot better. I don't know what's going on, and, and the military may be to blame for some of this activity. But according to the president's word, it's the protesters, the, the radical Islamists who are who are burning the churches, and that would be consistent with what we've seen in the past, and consistent. As to what we see in Iraq, what we've seen in, in, uh, in Syria, in Syria, these are not folks who are tolerant of other people's worldviews. They are not people who are tolerant of folks who do not agree with them. And as a result of that, uh, we should not be supporting them being put back into power. So uh, interpret what we heard from the president today. Was this a green light, if you will, from the United States, saying both sides do what you'd like? 
we're not going to we're not going to really have any say here. We're not putting any attaching any requirements to our foreign aid, and we're not cutting it back at all. Well, it, clearly the president's not taking sides. He's mm -hmm. condemning both sides, and uh, I think when you do that, you provide no leadership. Uh, the president has to determine who, uh, if you know, who's our friend there, who's who's someone we can we can be supportive of, and maybe maybe it is neither of those. Maybe there's a maybe there's something else out there. But for my money, uh, right now it seems to me that we need to we need to rely on a secular state. Which the military at this point gives us the best opportunity to get to get there. I want to play a bite. This is you from Iowa last week. Listen. Who's raising your children? Who's creating the moral imagination for the future of our country? It isn't what was at one time for 150 years in this country the storytellers. The storytellers were the family. The storytellers were the church civic and community organizations. They imparted the moral imagination. That is no longer the case. So here's my challenge to each and every one of you, is to engage. Engage, and you, Rick Santorum, are engaging. You've started a new film company, Echo Light Studios. Tell me about it. Where did this come from? Well, the company actually started about a year ago. Uh, it was a vision of two guys uh, from uh, from Texas who wanted, who had a, were running an existing studio, and they partnered with two guys from Hollywood, mm -hmm. and uh, two and two made, and hopefully more than four. And they brought me in to uh, to sort of take it to the next level. And uh, it's the first uh, vertically integrated movie production studio. It's called Echo Light Studios. We not only produce films, but we also also distribute those films, which, as you know, there's a lot of folks out there who make films. Right. The question is, how do you get them to where people can see them and uh, get them in all the different change, television and DVD mm -hmm. and VOD and on the theaters? Right. Well, we can do that uh, because of the experience that these two guys from Texas have. And uh, and so we're we're very excited. Uh, we're, we, we hope uh, to build something. I always say I hope to build in Dallas the equivalent of what Nashville did for music, uh, is some place from the heartland where heartland values. Uh, can be uh, seen on the on the uh, on the screen as opposed to uh, just what we're, is produced in New York and Los Angeles. And any projects in the hopper now? Uh, we are, we do have some projects that we'll be announcing uh, probably one next week and then probably one in about a month later. But uh, stay tuned. Okay. One more question. The big question: How soon would you have to announce your intention to run for president? Well, I mean. If you look at when most folks decide, uh, they make a decision usually the year before the election. Uh, so that would be 2015. Uh, would be sort of a uh, for me sort of a timing as to Is when it I a would have consideration at this point. You know, I, I'll say the same thing I said four years ago when people asked me. I, I get up every day. I thank God for the day, and I just say, "Okay, God, what do you want me to do?" And uh, I'm walking with you. And so I, people say, "Are you running?" I say, "No, I'm walking. Uh, I'm just trying to walk the walk." And right now, uh, I'm on this journey trying. To uh, lift him up in the culture and uh, make make uh, make films that tell how much he impacts people's lives and how positive he is, uh, and to affirm those values. And that's that's enough for me right now. And we'll wait and see what that leads to. Okay, Rick Santorum, thank you for being here. My pleasure. We'll be in thank touch. You. For more on Echo Light Studios, you can visit Echo Light. Dot com. And don't forget to check out Rick and Karen Santorum's online community promoting faith and family and freedom, PatriotVoices.com. Now to New York, where we are joined by our next guest. For 20 years, he's been the crusading president of the Catholic League and a tireless defender of civil rights and religious freedom. He recently squared off with Facebook over what they considered acceptable or unacceptable material. I'll let him tell you about it. To discuss that and to reflect on his 20 years at the League, joining us from New York is Bill Donahue. Bill, thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Raymond. Let's start with this Facebook controversy, which I was reading about as it was happening. Uh, this was an image, kind of an odd doctored image of the Virgin Mary, which I, I, I can't even show the audience. Uh, but there was a, a line attached to it on Facebook, and it said, uh, Mary should have aborted. You took umbrage with this and complained to Facebook. What happened? Well, they told us that it did not violate its hate uh, speech uh, stricture. They have 10 different categories of unacceptable fare. Now, to be fair to them, uh, this is a global organization. They have, a lot of people make complaints, and I think their criteria are actually pretty reasonable. 
Nonetheless, what bothered us is that uh, it seemed very obvious that this wasn't a matter of discourse. This was a matter of, in of trying to insult Christians. We weren't satisfied with the response. Others got involved and registered their complaints. And then the page was taken down, the offensive page. Hmm. But then more offensive pages that are similar were put up. Now, what we look at at the Catholic League is inconsistencies. We look to see if there's a, a duplicitous reaction. And that's what we found. Really? Overall, I say Facebook has been, has been very fair. But the fact of the matter is that they don't treat Catholics, Christians in general, the way they treat Muslims. They were much more protective of Muhammad than they are of Mary. Now, did they offer any explanation for that? I mean, the, the statement I read said that it really doesn't violate any of our community standards for hate speech, so there's nothing we can do. Well, we're in conversation with them uh, again trying to find out what can be done about this. You know, again, if they're treating all of us equally, then we don't really have much uh, leverage. But the fact of the matter is there was a cartoon of Muhammad lying down naked, so they showed his butt. Uh, and they said that was offensive. A aborting our blessed mother is not offensive. By the way, they have pictures of Sarah Palin, which I won't describe, mm -hmm. which are doctored photos to, to, the, to the audience. They're so vulgar. So what I'm saying is that Facebook needs to explain itself. You either you treat Mary the way you should uh, Muhammad, or, or, you, or you simply owe oh, oh, Catholics an explanation. We're looking for an apology if we can get one on that. We have to have a one standard for all, and we don't find that with Facebook. Now, again, this story is not over, uh, so we're going to report back when we find out what they're finally going to say about it. Bill, I know with all the talk of racial profiling in recent days, this sort of drew to your mind a comparison to religious profiling. What is religious profiling, and is this really a problem? It is a problem because now, again, let's take the Muslim example. Uh, our elites in our society who are very sensitive about racial profiling are also sensitive about Muslim profiling, like at airports and places like that. What about Catholic priests? Look, most Catholic priests are good men. They are faithful leaders in the Catholic Church. We have about 40,000 of them. We've had a couple of bad eggs. And when you choose only Catholic priests to insult and to mock and to ridicule and treat with disdain over and over again on the late night talk shows and Bill Maher and others, and they do it with impunity. They bring on guests who are very respectable people on there with Bill Maher and these other shows, and they sit there and they laugh along with it. Why is it okay to generalize from the individual to the collective in smearing 40,000 priests because, you know, decades ago we had some kind of problem with those who were uh, abusing uh, minors. We don't have that problem in the Catholic Church today. There are plenty of examples of this going on in other demographic uh, segments of our society. Nobody touches it. So I am concerned about these phonies who claim that they're exercised about r racial profiling or religious profiling of Muslims, but when it comes to Catholic priests, they, they act like this is, uh, this is okay. This is the kind of outrageous duplicity that we try to fight uh, against here on a, on a regular basis in the Catholic League. Bill, uh, this week the uh, Leadership Council of Women Religious was meeting in Orlando, and I know you recently were excised about something that you came across in the New York Times, and this was a piece on nuns. Uh, it was called Sisters for Life, and it was written by Lawrence Downs in the New York Times, and he wrote the following. If you think of Roman Catholic nuns only as walled-in ascetics or parochial school knuckle wrappers, the cloistered or the cruel, then you have not had the privilege of meeting any Mary Knowles sisters. Now, what's wrong with that, Bill? You know, this is amazing. That's the kind of position that a lot of liberal Catholics like Downs take. In other words, they stereotype nuns obviously the Orthodox nuns who were not in rebellion against the teachings of the Catholic Church. They act like as if they're all a retrograde, some kind of a, uh, a throwback to some, some, some nefarious age. And the only enlightened nuns are the ones who are actually in, oftentimes in rebellion against the magisterium or whose commitment to the to Catholic Church teachings is very selective. Now, it's precisely 
This is the mentality of a lot of liberal Catholics, not all of them, but too many of them. They are the ones who are stereotyping nuns. The nuns that I know of, the Sisters of Life and the, and the Dominican Sisters, Mary the Eucharist and the Passionist Sisters, so many good nuns in this country, they do not fit the negative stereotype that Downs is talking about. Mm -hmm. And so he has to try and make one up just to make the, the Mary No sisters look better. Hmm. Yeah, no, the, the knuckle cracker thing, haven't we? There, there's barely a nun left in schools, and we're still talking about knuckle crackers, you know, as if they're, they're running around. Bill, I, I want to shift gears before we run out of time. Mask there was the a knuckles huge, of these liberal Catholics, yeah. Yeah, there was a huge um, story out in California, and this is a measure that would have extended the statute of limitations on these sex abuse cases and the like for another year. Now, first of all, why... There, I know it was a San Jose uh, Democrat who came up with this idea. What was his reasoning for this? The person who came out with it, his name is pronounced B uh, Bell, spelled, spelled B-E-A-L-L. -L. This is a former Catholic who has it out against the Catholic Church, obviously. And instead of saying, let's go back and look at old cases and apply it to the public institutions as well as the private institutions, he selectively chooses the private institutions. Now, back in 2003, 10 years ago, they suspended the statute of limitations for a year to begin with right. on the Catholic Church, on the private institutions. Now they want to go back again. Now, they lost yesterday. I am very proud of Archbishop Gomez in Los Angeles, the yeoman work that he did. Corleone, the Archbishop in San Francisco, the Catholic Conference in California, the Catholic League. I am so proud of our members. We mailed out over 10,000 envelopes asking people to register their, their voice on this issue. And by the way, they certainly did. I love it when some people say, you know, you don't want to speak too loudly. Let me tell you something. If you speak too softly, no one will know what you're saying. <laughs> you have to speak loudly. I am so happy that the Catholic League members are responsibly aggressive. We weighed in on this, along with Archbishops Gomez, Corleone, the other bishops, the Catholic Conference. And yesterday, the bill never got out of conference. Now, look, this is a phony issue. We fought this in Colorado. We fought it in New York. If you're sincerely interested in fighting against child abuse in any form, then you have to have one law for everybody. This idea of cherry-picking, can you imagine if we had a law that only applied to public school teachers and this, and this would have only applied in the private sector is free? And, Bill, this would have only applied to the Catholic yes, Church and Boy only, Scouts, right? Well, any private institution. Now, mm -hmm. interestingly, uh, a lot of private institutions and schools like USC and others began to realize what's at stake here. You cannot plausibly maintain that you're interested in treating people equally and then support a, a, a bill which only applies to, by the way, the, most, the biggest offenders are in the public schools, and they were precisely the ones who were going to get a pass. Now, we are, let me tell you something. This bill may come back. It is stalled right now. It didn't get out of committee. Right. It could come back. And we are prepared to fight this again because of this duplicitous effort on the part of people who've got an axe to grind against the Catholic Church using a legitimate issue mm -hmm for political purposes. Bill, you have been at the Catholic League now for 20 years. When I tweeted this out the other day, I got a huge response from people in the email bin and other places. Congratulate Bill for me. And why did he come first to the Catholic League? So I want to ask you the question. What was it that first drew you to the Catholic League? Well, I have to give credit to the man who is now the uh, Cardinal, the Archbishop of Washington, Donald Wuerl. At that time, back in the early 90s, I was a professor at a small Catholic college in Pittsburgh at La Roche, hmm. and uh, he was the Pittsburgh bishop. And he contacted me and said, we need to have a Pittsburgh chapter of the Catholic League. The Catholic League, League at that time was uh, in dire straits. And hmm. make a long story short, uh, when they made the movement, the move to New York, uh, they, they looked at me, and, uh, but it was, was Cardinal Whirl, then the bishop hmm. of Pittsburgh, who I have to uh, give the, the greatest credit to because he's the one who lit the fire under me. Hmm. Let's talk about some of your greatest hits. And I was going down the list of, uh, you'd written a piece about sort of your remembrances of, of leading the Catholic League. And one of the first things on your list here is uh, 1994, the Disney movie Priest. Uh, how, recount that for people, what that was about and how you were instrumental in uh, pushing back the release date. 
Right. This was a movie put out by Miramax, which at that time was owned by Disney. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was about five priests. Every single one of them was dysfunctional. You never met a normal priest. Mm -hmm. And his dysfunctionality was explained because he was a priest. So this mm -hmm. was obviously a, an, an incredibly negative stereotype. If you did that against any other segment of the population, people would be screaming bloody murder. I registered a protest. I held a, uh, a press conference. Uh, at 1011, which is shorthand for 1011 First mm -hmm. Avenue, the Archdiocese headquarters, Cardinal O'Connor was uh, was in office at that time. I invited the media in. All these people from D Disney and Miramax came in, and I made Disney the focus. So I had the Lion King and Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny <laughs> and all these Dalmatians all over the place. They went crazy when they saw this thing, and they were going to open it up on Good Friday. Well, they didn't open it up on Good Friday. We made certain of that because we registered such a protest, I threw them out of the building. I said, if you want to have a, uh, a press conference of your own, have it in the street where you belong. They tried to crash my press conference. They, meaning the Disney Miramax people, they lost on that. It was a sweet victory to put it to them. And it was one of those vile uh, movies that I'd never seen against the Catholic Church. Again, picking on our priest. Mm. Let's talk about 2000. Uh, it was the first time that the House uh, appointed a Catholic chaplain for the House of Representatives. You were very involved in that effort. Tell me about it. Yes, and at that time, there was a Catholic priest who would have been, and he, in fact, he did become, yeah. um, a, a, the very first uh, priest ever to be chosen as the House chaplain. It was promised to him, and then it was taken away. And quite frankly, we had some problems at that time with some of our evangelical friends who were angry at the fact that a Catholic priest would be the first house chaplain. So I took them on, and I say mm -hmm. them, I took on a lot of Republicans. And people don't have to understand, I am proudly a conservative, but I am not a Republican, I am not a Democrat. I go where the action is, and at, this, at that time, uh, the people who were exhibiting anti-Catholicism were coming from the Republican Party, uh, and, and they were evangelicals, and I went right at them. And uh, we succeeded in, in raising such a fuss. I mean, people from Washington were demanding that I come down to Washington every day. <laughs> a lot of big names. Uh, I don't want to go through it all right now. Some of them I had a, a fight with, and we've subsequently become friends, so mm -hmm. I don't want to go back over it. Sure. But I can tell you, I stuck to my guns, and at the end of the day, a priest became the first Catholic chaplain in the House of Representatives. Bill, uh, as you look back on these 20 years, what is the commendation, and I know you've got shelves loaded with awards and citations, what is the recognition that you are most fond of? There's one that does stand out, Ray, and it, one, of the, one of the priests I love very dearly was Cardinal O'Connor, uh, the Archbishop of New York. And literally three weeks before he passed away, he had signed a letter, he had written a letter uh, that was a tribute to me, that was presented to me at a dinner at the Crisis Magazine uh, in Washington, D.C. It's hanging on my wall, along with many other great awards, which I'm very happy with the Catholic community, Legatus, so many different organizations have given me such great tributes. But the one by Cardinal O'Connor, because it was so personal, mm -hmm. and it wasn't just another annual award, mm -hmm. and because I love the man so dearly, that's one that, to me, is, is probably the most precious of them all. Bill Donahue, thank you so much for being here. We'll see you again soon. Yes, we're going to continue the fight and speak loudly. Oh, well, there, is there any other way, Bill, really? <laughs> thank you, Bill Donahue. To follow Bill Donahue and his work at the Catholic League, visit their website, catholicleague.org. Now to our Unseen Hero segment, where we introduce you to everyday people leading extraordinary and inspirational lives. Now, last week, we heard reports of a mystery angel priest who came out of nowhere to minister and comfort a young woman who was the victim of a head-on collision in Missouri. The priest, it was said, appeared almost miraculously after the woman requested prayers from rescue crews on the scene. Then as quickly as he came, the priest vanished. Blogs and news accounts were a Twitter about an angel who had come to this young woman. Others said it was Padre Pio. The mystery continued until this week, when wouldn't you know it, Father Dowling had to crack the case. Father Patrick Dowling of the Diocese of Jefferson City, Missouri, was the priest who came to Katie Lentz's aid. Please welcome the formerly unseen hero, 
Father Patrick Dowling. Welcome to the show, Father. I want to start with this first question that I certainly had when I read this story. Uh, Katie Lentz is uh, in this terrible car accident. She is trapped between the steering wheel and the seat, and they've been trying for an hour to remove her unsuccessfully. You happen upon this scene. You're in your car between assignments. What made you stop and get out? Well, because I'm a priest, I cannot pass the scene of an accident where a person might be in danger of his or her life and um, uh, deny him or her the ministries of the church. Mm -hmm. But, but what, I mean, this, you know, was, this was rather extraordinary, though, Father. I mean, you're, the, the, the roads are closed off for, what, a mile around? You, you park and walk out into the field to, to, do the, to, to, to meet this young woman. Oh, no. You see, I arrived, um, and I was already inside the cordoned area. Ah. And the sheriff began to clear the traffic, and... Um, I didn't go because I wasn't specifically, you know, he permitted me to remain. Mm -hmm. And then when the traffic was cleared, I drove up to probably less than 100 yards from the scene. Mm -hmm. And then I walked over. So it, it uh -huh. really was very simple. Now, Katie is a 19-year-old uh, girl. She's trapped in the car. She's asking people to pray aloud. And you walked over. Now, yeah. she's a member of the Assemblies of God, not a Catholic Church. That's right. Here comes a Catholic priest. What happened? Oh, I, I'm not even sure whether she would have seen me. I, I absolved her, and I anointed her. And then she said something, and I said, I repeated the absolution because I felt now she was responding a little and maybe in a better let's say, disposition to receive validly, and I absolved mm -hmm. her, repeated the absolution. And then um, I just went away, and some people came after me. One person came after me, asking me to go back. She wants me to pray with her. I went back, and she seemed to welcome me, asked me to pray that mm -hmm. her leg, which was hurting, would not hurt her. Mm -hmm. And I just said that prayer aloud. And then I decided that if I stayed there any longer, I would be getting in the way of people who need to work. And I pulled back to one side and began to say my rosary hmm. uh, out of out, uh, silently, you know, uh, out of sure. sight of just maybe six, eight, ten feet maybe from the, where Katie uh -huh. was. Because there are a lot of emergency people coming in at this time. And I want to share one of yeah. them with you. Now, this is, uh, I believe, the fire chief uh, in New London. And Raymond yeah. Reed is yes. his name. He had this to say, and this story really informed some of the lore surrounding this mysterious angelic priest that came upon this scene. Give a listen, and I want your reaction, Father Dowling. I can't be for certain what, who said, or how it was said, or where it come from, but myself and one of, one of the other firefighters that was uh, beside me, um, we, we very plainly heard that, that we should remain calm that uh, our tools would, would now work and that we would get her out of that vehicle. And that's indeed what happened. The, the, the tools did work. She was removed from the vehicle. And many said, you said that, did you? No, I did not say that. I didn't know that the tools weren't working, and I certainly did not know that they would succeed in removing her from the vehicle. I knew nothing about that. Hmm. Now, witnesses there, Father, at the scene, they, they all said this priest came in and then he mysteriously disappeared. When did you take your leave and where did you go? I, I continue saying my rosary. It seems like for about an hour. I probably oh. am overstating it. Wow. I, I remain there and, and as long as it took for them to remove Katie from the vehicle. And hmm. they placed her on a stretcher then. And I went over and kind of had a chance to kind of satisfy myself that she was in one piece. Mm -hmm. And then I said, now I'm happy. I'll go on my way. And. Um, I was, I just walked, oh, I turned to the sheriff beside, I think it was the sheriff anyway, and I shook hands and thanked him because he was the one who gave me permission to approach. Aha. Uh -huh. You follow? Yeah, and I, it's I, interesting. I shook his hand and thanked him. 
Yeah, yeah and it's then, amazing um, that they went didn't. over to my car. Yeah, it's amazing no one, you know, <laughs> knew your name. And I know you'd shared it with people on your way in and out. Here's my question, Father. As you watch this story yeah. mature in the media, as you saw the blog posts and the Catholic media and the international media pick this story up, and people were saying it was a priest that looked like Walter Matthau, another said it was Padre Pio. What were you thinking through all of this? Uh, actually, I, I don't watch television. Well, that's a good <laughs> and thing. I knew nothing. <laughs> I, uh, maybe I have to have seen, or, or from time to time over over the years, I've seen television. Maybe, uh -huh. But certainly, you know, I, I listen to you on the radio, Raymond. Ah, well, thank you. Well, I'm glad uh, you I, get me somehow. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, but but, but let me. Let, where, where are we? Oh, yeah. How? How did I? Re See, yeah. I didn't know until Friday morning. The accident was Sunday. Right. And Friday morning, a priest whom I had told about the you know stopping to anoint the girl mm -hmm. told me this thing is. Uh, the, the media are looking for the priest who did this, and uh, they say he's a mystery man or something. Uh -huh. So I decided that at that stage, uh, you know, gosh, really, I do need to speak to her mother and let her know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I made an attempt unsuccessfully, so I sent her an email. Uh -huh. And um, uh, so my concern there was that the mother would know yeah. what happened. And then you went on the National yeah. Catholic Register website and left a little thing in their comments section under the story, <laughs> right? I, 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 I did. Uh, that I was saying to myself, me and my big mouth, <laughs> could I <laughs> not have kept, kept that to myself? And um, um, anyway, you see, the point is, I wasn't trying to remain a uh, mystery. Sure. Um, and there was no wrongdoing in making it known, and um, it, it seemed a natural thing to do, yeah. um, uh, to, to make it known in, in the, the one media of communication. That I <laughs> well, let me say, Father, I, I, we got a lot of emails from people who were disappointed. They said, oh, we'd hoped it was Padre Pio or some angel. And you know, my take on it is, I, f I think it's more edifying that you have a priest going about his duties in a miraculous way, unintentionally. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Doing. And as a result of that, it, it inflames other people's faith. It brings hope and peace at a moment of distress. That seems to me as big a miracle as any angel or Padre Pio showing up. The point is, you, you're dead right. You see, every priest can forgive sins. Every priest can anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith saves the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. Hmm. See that in James, don't you, James, uh, uh, Raymond? Yeah. Father, do you see yourself as a hero? Any, any priest, any priest. <laughs> I am. Um, I'll take that as a no. I try to be a priest. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be a priest, not a hero. Hmm. And I did what a priest does. Well, and every priest in. in that I know if they would pass by an accident, uh, they wouldn't do that. Well, let me tell you, uh, in my humble opinion, you were both on that day, both a priest and a hero, and we thank you so much for being on the program and for all you do, day in and day out. <laughs> thank you, Raymond. We'll see you soon thank and you so keep much, us in yeah. your prayers. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Father P uh, Patrick Dowling, thanks again. And finally, on August 10th, we learned of the passing of William P. Clark, a trusted friend and national security advisor to President Ronald Reagan. Judge Clark died after a long battle with Parkinson's. He was 81 years old. I had the great pleasure of sitting down with him in 2009 for an in-depth interview. Clark was quite a man, a rancher, lawyer, former aide to Ronald Reagan while in California. And later, he served as Secretary of the Interior during the Reagan presidency. What many don't realize is that Judge Clark was instrumental in establishing diplomatic relations between the Vatican and the United States in 1984. I spoke with him about his long career in state government, as well as the rest of his tenure in Washington during the Reagan years. And we also talked about his Catholic faith. It was such an important part of his life. We met at his beloved ranch near Paso Robles. Here is an encore, my exclusive interview with Judge William P. Clark. In 1982, you were the National Security Advisor to mm -hmm. the President. You all had many conversations about communism. 
the threat of communism. And you had your own both moral and political take on this. It was shared with the president, wasn't it? What was the, what were the, what was the tenor of the conversations and the length of the conversations that you had with the president? Because you hatched a strategy. It wasn't just a notion about what this was. There was a strategy and a mindset to block it and destroy it, if possible. Correct. Yes? Yes, roll it back, at least, in the beginning, and hopefully uh, uh, undermine it, destroy it by showing the truth behind uh, the different groups, and uh, elevated it to national level. Um, the earlier days, of course, it said uh, it could not be done in our lifetimes. It was too entrenched, the Soviets were winning, Soviets knew they were winning, and uh, would sooner fight a war on the subject than to, uh, uh, to lose its footing in Eastern and Central Europe. Bill Casey, who was the CIA director, is often credited with um, masterminding this strategy of bringing the Vatican and the United States together and somehow uh, forging an alliance that really brought about the end of communism. The fact is, you also had a lot to do with that, yes? Oh, I don't know. I... Oh, come on. <laughs> what, whatever. I've read, I've read the memos and seen the letters. The fact <laughs> is, you were at the centerpiece of this as well. I mean, it was you reaching out to the Vatican and making this happen, Judge Clark. All right. I'll, I'll stand accused, but okay. not proven yet. <laughs> well, I have the documents if you'd like to sit, if, if, if no, you want to approach I... the bench. <laughs> In 1981, Solidarity, the movement that had begun to grow in Poland, this resistance movement to the communism, uh, the communist government mm -hmm. that was in place, you all were very concerned in 81 because it was outlawed at that point and roundups had begun. There was a very difficult choice that the administration had to make about how to respond to this. The president calls the pope. What was the nature of that conversation, do you recall? Well, there had been preceding conversations uh, not uh, by, by phone, but by courier, back channel, and um, dealing with the Cardinal Piologi, who uh, was certainly on our side, no question about that, in our policy that was developing. And he was the Vatican ambassador to the United States at the time, the nuncio. Uh, that's, that's right, and uh, died just a couple of months ago. Wonderful man, we, we would meet uh, in one way or another every week, usually off the record. And Bill Casey and I would go up Connecticut Avenue to his residence, and um, we'd uh, call the project uh, Cappuccino. Now, why did you do that? Because we like Cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that, over the phone, we'd, that's how the meeting would be set up. Oh, Would you see. like some cappuccino today? And that meant intelligence as to what the Soviets were doing, <laughs> moving in for total takeover of the Polish government and Jaruzelski. And um, we'd uh, get together, uh, just Casey, no, na no note, note takers, but uh, just uh, people who enjoyed cappuccino. Mm, I see. And it was planned that way. Yes, this was all done very quietly. State didn't know, Secretary of State was, State wasn't involved. Everyone was sort of kept in the dark on this. This it was had, a- It had to be. Real cloak and dagger or, uh, it, operation. Had it gotten to a State Department, typically it would be leaked to the Washington Post or mm -hmm. uh, certainly back to uh, lower levels of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of the projects that was kept in total darkness. This relationship, this um, secretive relationship between you and Bill Casey at the CIA and Ronald Reagan and the Pope, mm -hmm. via Piologi, the, the nuncio in Washington, this organization was very tight and very precise in its actions. I mean, in that, in that 81 showdown, to my eye, when there was the threat that the communist authorities were going to move against solidarity, the pr what were you all prepared to do at that point? What did the Reagan administration say they were prepared to do? We uh, really didn't uh, expose our hand 
as far as I knew we would go at that time, again, for fear of it leaking. Mm -hmm. That's a great Washington term for unauthorized disclosure of sensitive information, mm -hmm. a felony, but a uh, felony committed more in its practice than uh, you realize. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, projecting uh, both uh, there and uh, a few other fronts, uh, I think the president was ready to uh, to use whatever force uh, and and might military force that appeared reasonably necessary to stop the Soviets from doing another Czech Czechoslovakia. Let's talk a bit about how this finally played out in 1982. You are the primary ambassador to go to the Vatican on behalf of the president and set up a meeting, the first face-to-face -face meeting between John Paul II and President Reagan. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that meeting of June of 1982, when the president and the pope finally meet face-to-face. -face. You were there. Yes, as was uh, my staff and my wife, and mm -hmm. the meeting we'll never forget. It was uh, just one full day, but uh, it uh, gave the president and pope the ability to form a very personal relationship from then on. They, uh, there's so many parallels in their lives. They're, they each had been shot uh, and almost killed within four weeks apart and uh, through assassination. Um, people uh, do not have the hard evidence on it, but they, they feel that uh, that was the Islamic uh, approach to life or death. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've uh, avoided, as had Ronald Reagan, speculating as to the background of the plot, because what difference does it make? It, it happened, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it brought the men closer together. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, coming out of that meeting, that they shared this spiritual mission and this spiritual simpatico, if you will? Well, they did share it, and, they, and it, it began long before that meeting in June. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, our detractors in our administration said that it was really uh, not the way to go mm -hmm. for many reasons and could result in greater conflict with Moscow, but it didn't. <laughs> There were seven more meetings, between, or six more meetings between the president and the pope following that. I'm sure you believe, I, I certainly believe, that this was a pivotal moment, not only in watching communism then tumble, but it was, it was the moment on which everything began to turn, and history, the history of the 20th century began to turn. This relationship between these two men, and your involvement and vision for this relationship. I think it was an important moment, and I think the Soviets recognized it and started to take a longer look at uh, their own strategy and, and uh, beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. You met Ronald Reagan in 1965, and he asks you to run for office. You told him what? Well, uh, I told him uh, I, in the first conversation that I felt that I probably could not. Again, that size of the family, and uh, uh, he wanted me to run for the assembly, and as did others from our assembly district. And I concluded that uh, that was not the time. I had a young law practice, and uh, but he added that if he should run for a public office, he would be calling me to join him in some position. And I said, fine, not expecting really to receive that phone call. Mm -hmm. uh, but it did come, of course. Mm -hmm. And you, you joined his run for the uh, governorship of California. You're at his side the, early on. What was the source of that bond? Because you all were very close. I mean, intimates, everybody from Cap Weinberg to, to, uh, to people who worked for you uh, in the national security apparatus in the White House say there was this chemistry between you two. What was the source of that chemistry? Yes, well, the source, uh, of course, 
um, would be difficult to, almost mystical at one time. And um, we uh, communicated frequently, usually in few words. Like my father, uh, he was a man of few words, may have been tagged as a great communicator, but um, a very private man. And of course, I've been accused of being the same. And so <laughs> we uh, conferred frequently, but not in great uh, verbosity. In the biography that uh, the, the judge, they talk about you, the relationship you had with your father, and how when you all were in a corral, you could intuit what he was telling you to do simply by looking at him, and that that was similar to the relationship between you and Reagan. Is that true? I think so. It's probably a good analogy. Um, and uh, at times, uh, I would be doing something, and Nancy or someone would say, Ronnie, uh, why is Bill Clark doing that? And uh, he would uh, smile and say, probably because I told him to. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> One gets a sense from reading the history of this that there was almost a spiritual a bond that you all had. It was much deeper than just an aide or someone who could anticipate the thoughts of another. Would you say that's accurate? Oh, I think so. Um, part of the DP, I would have to conclude, and have many a time. DP, divine providence, by the way. Or, or divine plan. Divine plan. And um, he, uh, as has been written since, with a little help from here, a very spiritual person. He um, understood more about our church than most Catholics that I know. Uh, so there was uh, that bond. We didn't talk about it. We just seemed to be on parallel tracks most of the time. How do you want to be remembered, Judge Clark? Well, I haven't thought about that. Well, I'm trying to get you to think about well, it. Well, maybe I should seek your counsel. Well, my counsel won't <laughs> help you, because you were talking a moment ago about low cognitive ability. I'm here to help you realize how advanced yours is in I comparison see. to mine. So that's what... Well, you see, I have a guide dog here. Really I see that. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> You're evading my question. Now, how would I... How would you to... like to be remembered? Oh, as having... Uh done my best to maintain uh, a Christian family and and uh, but I, I don't worry too much or concern myself with how I might or might not be remembered. I, people will ask me why I didn't write a biography as did my colleagues mm -hmm. 25 years ago and uh, it just never really crossed my mind that it would offer that much to anyone in particular. Having read this biography and having watched your career through most of my life, uh, and, and in recent years certainly becoming more fully avail aware of what you did when in public service, it seems to me the lesson here is that if one focuses on the true essentials and the priorities, as you mentioned a moment ago, maintaining your family, uh, honoring your commitment to, to God in your public life and in your private life, that that really is what this is all about. It's not what one accomplishes with the glory or honors or titles that one accrues, but it's those things that last. And it seems that's what shines out from your life. Despite mm -hmm. the great things and the, and the monumental events you were a part of and parcel of, don't you think that's a great lesson to share with people? Well, it's, it's, it's out there, I hope. If it, uh, looking at it another way, if it helps save one soul, it's been worth the effort, I suppose. Yeah. Yes, and as your good friend, um, Mother Teresa, you got to know so well, has admonished, uh, God expects us to not be successful, but to be faithful, and, and I try to follow that theme, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm uh, one of those that uh, stumble along, fall down, and get up and try to go again. The Judge, William P. Clark, Ronald Reagan's top hand, co-authored by Paul Kangor and Patricia Clark Dorner, is available at bookstores everywhere and through the EWTN Religious Catalog. It's a great read about a great life.
That is all the time we have. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. As always, the Twitter and Facebook pages are linked on the left-hand side of my site, RaymondArroyo.com. And don't forget to sign up for my weekly e-blasts. I had some really important stories for you this week. Don't miss out. You can sign up free at RaymondArroyo.com. A very happy birthday to a very special girl. Mariella is eight, and I love her. Happy birthday, honey. And be sure to tune in next week for our exclusive interview with Lord David Alton from the UK's Parliament and an eye-opening look at human trafficking with Natalie Lummert from the U.S. Bishop's Office of Migration and Refugee Services. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.